Hello, today on Research Aromatica, we are joined by Denzel Phillips, who will be presenting on Oud, Wood of the Gods, from Endangered Species to Integrated Farming. Before we get started, I am going to read just a little bit of Denzel's bio. He asked me to, to shorten it. His, he has a lot of experience, over 30 years of experience, in fact, of working in the field of rural development international trade, and small business development. He has successfully established and run a series of specialized companies involved in the production, processing, and sale of high-value natural products, and he specializes in non-timber forest products. So Denzel, we're going to get the slideshow up here. Good. Okay, here it comes. And so let's start by asking you, what on earth is agarwood? Well, just before I answer this question, and I hope you can all hear me, um, I would like to thank my hosts. Uh, they've done a wonderful job in putting this thing together, and I haven't been an easy customer to pretend because I'm off-site, if you like, I'm out of office. So I'd like to thank you all first, especially Ross Henry, but of course my hostess, and friend Anjanette. So now let's get, what on earth is agarwood? Yeah, well, um, the first thing, it is not a plant um, because people get rather confused. Um, agarwood is actually a pathological material which is created on two or at least three species of tree um, because of wounding, cutting, or uh, disease. And so we basically, um, it's a disease. And uh, uh, as such, it's quite unusual, I think, to give an essential oil expert a diseased piece of a plant to go and distill. But that in reality is what we're doing. Um, and so the first thing is we, we may have, we've got a lot of different trees. We've got a lot of different names in the 16th century Marco Polo and people like that begun to hear about it from the East. They used to call it aloes wood. And then when a lot of people saw that word, they thought they were talking about aloe vera and they got very confused. But as hardly anybody in the West had ever seen it, um, they didn't, an eagle wood aquilaria comes from aquilaria, it's a Latin word. So the, the main species of agarwood agar wood is uh, from, the, from the plant, the aquilaria plant. But the Arab world called it Oud, and so that's how we mainly talk about it. So here's a wonderful stand of, these are probably 30, could be 20, 30 year old Aquilaria trees, tall, straight trees. They're completely worthless, ironically, other than environmentally, of course, producing CO2 and all the other things that trees do, but they have very little value as timber. They're very soft wood. You chop them, it's white, and it has, you can't build houses or do much with it. They do grind it up occasionally. Next slide, please. So as I said, it's the genus Aquilaria, which is the one that is predominant. Uh, but we didn't realize suddenly after working with Arga Wood for maybe 15 years, people suddenly discovered in Papua New Guinea that the Gerinopsis Genera also produced arborwood. So whoops, everybody had to start looking again and realizing that Aquilaria is not the only source of arborwood, which again confused botanists and experts like myself. So we had to sort of add on another species, another, another genera indeed. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, there are at least 18 species of Aquilaria and uh, two of, of, of Gerinopsis that we know about. Again, there is a lot of confusion. And when I started in this field, um, there was no real work on DNA fingerprinting. And it's still not completed in the Aquilaria field. So we've still got a lot of overlap, rather like and Jeanette and I have found with frankincense and Boswellia, we still are learning. We're still discovering new ones. 
and I would not like to say this is a complete list, some might be merging with others. So uh, you'll see if you look at that list, the ones that are written in yellow are the ones that we're going to really interested in today, uh, the ones that are used commercially to produce both incense and oils. Uh, you can see the wonderful seed, that, uh, and it's, it's a, a wonderful seed which naturally produces this strange tree. Okay, next slide, please. So what happens with Agarwood? The first thing you need to realize, you're entering a world, and I didn't know this when I started, which is very secret and very dangerous. Um, Arborwood is, a, you know, in some cases worth more than gold. Um, it's, it's, it's normally been illegal in many cases to harvest it or cut down the trees. So um, people who do are uh, very careful in what they do and don't talk about it. So basically you're entering a world rather like you're, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with cocaine or something. All the time that I worked and TRP worked in Vietnam, you'll hear about this a little bit more, we had police or forest officers watching us constantly, day and night. We never were able to be in, in peace because they wanted to see what we were doing. So we've got a, a very rare thing. People hide it from each other. They cut it down. If they found a, a tree they think is diseased, and they'll hide it. They'll dig it underground, and they'll do that for two reasons. One, to hide it from their friends, but also they believe that it's rather like a wine. If it, if it gets underground for many years, it actually improves the, the white non-resinous wood is eaten by animal, insects and animals, and the, the resinous wood remains. So, and they will take out like a bank. They'll take little bits out of it from time to time whenever they need money. So they'll take a few few hundred grams and that will be enough to live on for a week. So it, it, it has a, you know, a very similar scenario to somebody who's secretly got a bank account. Next, next slide. <coughs> okay, so what happens then in the traditional system? Basically, yeah, let's stick to Aquilaria because it's, it's roughly the same, the system. So the tree grows up, probably this figure is, I don't want to be quoted on this figure, but between 5,000 and 10,000, one in 5,000 and one in 10,000 trees in the wild would contain significant quantities of wood or resin, be worth something. So it's roulette here. We've got a roulette situation. What tree do I cut down? How do I know it's there? How can I encourage it? Um, so um, that in itself is a secret. You will find in order to try and encourage it, all sorts of very strange reasonings were given. Uh, we know that it was wounding. I have seen trees in Thailand where 10,000 nails have been driven into a tree all the way up. So what you're looking at is like, like a tree with nails all over it because they're trying to wound the tree to death, in fact. So it's a very cruel uh, world out there for the poor old Aquilaria tree. Um, but the other thing is, because you don't know whether your tree has got it, you'll find that foresters who want this so badly will chop down a lot of trees and half of them they won't need or more than half. Anyway, you're lucky. You find your tree, you find your pot of gold. What do you do with it? You, just, you tend to hide it under the ground. And then you take it out, the, 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 the resinous or semi-resinous parts, the parts that look as if they've got black bit, and then you start cleaning it. And you will, that cleaning process will go on for years. You will find if you go into Dubai, into the soup, or you go into Bangkok, into the back, there'll be little people just chewing, this, you know, having a, a, a coffee and cleaning a piece of agar wood. Hours upon hours upon hours, taking out every drop of dirt, every drop, because the nicer it looks, the polit, the better the money. So there's there are these different stages that go on, and it's obviously a very long chain and a very secret chain from the tree in the forest, which we don't know where it is, to the thing to these chips, and they're very small. They can be anything above a kilo is exceptional. We're talking about a few hundred grams, chips and, 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 and 
thinnings. Okay, next slide, please. So what's the history behind this? What is, where did it get? One of the interesting things when we started work on this 24, 25 years ago, I suppose now, um, is the Western world hardly knew anything about it. And because it was not known in the Western world, it, it didn't exist, you know, in a funny sort of way. If it wasn't in Western books or in Western movies, then it doesn't really do. But it's been very big, started in Hinduism. It's central and core and most interest has started in, in Japan. Both the Buddhist and Taoist religions, which are both very important in Japan, uh, Aga Wood plays a very central role. If you go into almost any house in Japan, you will find, as you know, um, a, a picture of, of the who knows about tea ceremony, and a lot of people know about flower ceremony, two central features of Japanese. Well, what they don't know necessarily, and I certainly didn't know before I went to Japan, is that actually the, the apex of this triangle of culture is incense ceremony. And these incense games, which the tales of Genji and other great literature in Japan talk about, is the most uh, cultured activity that anybody can do in, in Japan. And only the aristocracy and only the, the, the religious leaders are involved in this ceremonial activity, which com almost completely died out in the Second World War and after, and has only since the 1950s been, and late 60s has been revived. But it's the most honored thing you can ask somebody to do in Japan is to participate in an incense ceremony. And it's a game where you, you smell different things and see what they are, and you try and find out what Next slide, please. So where does Arborwood live? It's surprising, Aquilera, as you saw, there were 13 different species and subspecies. It grows in a fairly wide range of tropical environments from sea level to about 800, 850 meters. It hates bad drainage. That's the only thing I can tell you. It always, wherever I've been with it, You've got to put it in areas, it likes slopes, it likes clean drainage. Um, uh, so that's important. It needs uniform rain throughout the year. It does not like long dry seasons. So it's a classic tropical tree. It grows up to somewhere up to 40 meters high. Uh, and basically in the wild, you wouldn't find harvest between and before eight and 10 years. And the new trees in the farming, which we'll talk about later, basically we recommend don't harvest until eight years at least before you begin to see serious quantities. But the big question that everybody I'm sure might ask me or is why, why don't Arga would grow? Why, why isn't it available Aquilera outside of Southeast Asia? We don't know, but it is not so far as we know found anywhere else but Southeast Asia. And you'll see where in a minute in the slides. Next slide, please. So where is the major producing countries? Um, the, now, the major producing country, as you see here, are Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, uh, w whether this is the, the, this is, it does not signify that this is the most, um, suitable necessary areas, but these are the parts of the world where there are large areas um, where there are no civilization has not really entered. And I think that is the, the key story for Arga Wood in the wild. Wherever man has, has encroached, the Arga Wood has disappeared. Um, and so wherever there are huge areas still uncharted, un you know, where there are no mobile phones, where there are no roads. This is where you will find Arga. And that's why you will still find that most of the Arga wood in the wild is in very unreachable places. And as you see, Indonesia, Malaysia. Now, again, Indonesia, the real heart of the Indonesian Arga is actually West Papua, which, as you know, is the other side of Papua New Guinea. And they found, obviously, on both sides of Papua New Guinea. 
Why? Because it's the most unpopulated part of the whole of Indonesia. Similarly, in Malaysia, mainland Malaysia, there's very little wild aquilaria. Almost all of it is in Sabah and Sarawak. And that goes on through. Now, the minor areas, we, we call them minor, but maybe it's the wrong word. Vietnam, which you, you'll see in a minute, is actually the, the place where some of the best arborwood in the world has arborwood, and that's some very good, and is where we centered our project. Um, uh, it, it has a lot, Laos, they had a lot, but due to things like the Vietnam War, which defoliated hundreds of thousands of acres of land, a lot of that arborwood was destroyed, either by bombing or, or, or other reasons. So that part of the world, um, India population. So for the Indians, for instance, for the, uh, and for the people of the Arab world, they love Indian Kurishani arborwood, but it, it virtually disappeared. Everybody talks about it a lot, but when you actually go and ask them, I want to see a sample of wild harvested arborwood from Assam, it hardly exists. So later, all of it is wildly inaccurate because you're talking about cultures that use arborwood. That is the Chinese culture, which use it in medicine. And it's, it's, and it's very much centered around Riyadh and the royal family. The royal family buy between one and two million dollars worth of arborwood a year just for their palace use. I've met the buyer who was involved in doing that. But, and, and, and throughout Ramadan, you will find arborwood being burned almost in every rich man's house or middle class house in, in that part of Saudi Arabia, but you might not find it in Jeddah. So that's interesting. In, in, in uh, China, it's all come through Hong Kong and Singapore. Singapore is the huge trading center for the Southeast Asia for the Chinese community. Huge warehouses in Khaki Phuket, just outside the airport, where I thousands of tons of arborwood is brought in from Papua New Guinea, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from everywhere, and then sold into the big Chinese market. Um, and then finally, we have um, the, the markets in, in Dubai, which has become the center for distribution as well, and where the world's largest distiller and perfumer of arborwood, Ajmal, uh, sits, uh, and we'll talk about it a bit later. The miner produced, the European market has not been interested in arborwood until the last, I would say, 15 to 20 years. And even then, the amount that they, of, of natural product, and certainly wild harvested material that they use, is negligible, because obviously, uh, and, and there are restrictions on its use anyway. Okay, so, and the same goes for North America. Next slide, please. This slide has been prepared by Traffic International, which, as you may or may not know, is, uh, uh, works with CITES to monitor trade in endangered species. These are some figures that they put out from formal information that they had um, about the trade in, in uh, United Emir Arab Emirates. Now, the interesting thing about that diagram, one is the scale they talk about uh, 500 tons, 200 tons coming in and 487 going out. Well, the first question is where from? And, uh, and the second issue is the amount, I would say is one third of the real amount that's likely to be going through there. Uh, certainly not more than 50% in the world is monitored through CITES. Uh, and as you can see on the map on the right, that is where it's coming from, mainly some going into France, into grass for distillation nowadays, but mainly through there. Thank you. Ne next slide, please. Okay, so what determines the price of arborwood? Um, we're talking, we have two different issues here, one which is the incense uh, and one which is the oil, which is slightly different. So th th this year I'm talking about the, the oil mainly. Uh, everybody, if you go into a market and say Dubai, the Arab world, and say, I want the best arborwood oil you've got, the best oud you can, 
they will say Indy, Indy oil, Indian oil, and they will say Indian oil, Purusha. But frankly speaking, it hardly exists in the world. There is now some uh, plantation argoid, which we'll talk about in a minute, but very little in India. And then they go down according to where they are used to. Um, but basically, the country of origin is just an attempt to reflect the quality that they consider interesting. So you'll find Cambodia oil is Cambodian oil is considered good because it's pretty dark. Then you've got the aroma issue, which is, as regards the local people, it's very, you know, very personal, very, very personal, and there's very little scientific work. There are no standards, and until recently, very little work on the chemical structure. The lasting quality is very important, the thing that everybody will remark in the Western world. I can't get rid of this stuff, it keeps smelling. I, you know, it, you know, two days, you can put a small drop on your hand of pure agua, and two or three days later, it's still there. You wash, you wash, you shower, and it's still there. It has an amazing lasting quality. And that obviously is, is, is very important, but is sometimes seen as a negative. And then the, the density of oil. The, the, the density of oil is very important. The thicker the oil, the higher the quality. Next slide, please. So everybody always asks, you know, how much is it worth? What's it worth? How long is this piece of string? It's very much like a, a, a wine. So how much is a bottle of wine worth? Um, and that's exactly the way I would describe it. Here is, this is a Malaysian, um, uh, and, and this is a Malaysian, string. this is a Singapore grading system here. And um, that is roughly right in terms of what, Lowest grade oil, very thin oil, very yellowy in color, very little lasting quality, it might be $1,000 a kilo. Up to the best, very heavy, very dark, very long lasting, 30,000 probably. Could go up, and if it really is Indian oil, it really is all what's coming in a minute, Kina, oil from Vietnam, it might hit 50,000. But as hardly anybody's ever seen it or can afford to use it, we're really talking in research and academic purposes. Next slide, please. So the chips, what are the chips worth? Well, the first thing to realize is that you don't, the good oil rich chips and pieces, you don't distill. You distill the bad stuff. So all the finest dargo wood in the world is actually being used, is going to Japan or Korea for incense burning and, and, and not so much for, for, for the use in distillation. And that is one of the issues when, when we talk about price. When I mention the word 30, 50,000, that is if you would take incense quality pieces and start to distill them whereas most of the time they will be using these brokens and off, off cuts. And as you can see, there are many different grades. I told you about the people who clean them, the cleanliness and the shape. Now, to you and me, you would not know the difference between one shape and another. These are almost spiritual things. So you'll find in Japan and Korea and even in the Buddhist Islamic world, people will get a piece of agua because they like its shape. They like its shine and no other reason. They'll pay more for one that looks nice than another one that doesn't. And, and all those fine pieces are always kept away, locked away in cabinets. You'll never see them in the shop. Front. Next slide, please. So um, distillation. As I've just told you, people uh, sometimes do not understand that, that the agar wood that is used mainly for distillation is of mid, low to middle quality. It's very rare that people distill top quality agar wood, incense wood. The main centers are most definitely around Bangkok. There are many distillation units there. You'll find many Arabs have bought places out in there and have set up small distillation units. 
They're very difficult to find. Don't think you can just walk her in there and find. They're all locked. They've got guards. You can't get in very easily. You've got to know people. You've got to walk around. You won't see them, and they're never in the center of town. They're all on the edges. But you'll be very surprised to find some rich Arab has set up a very nice distillation, stainless steel distillation unit out there. I have no idea how many there are, but there are quite a few. Uh, Saigon, which is where I was working and uh, the TRP project was, um, again, outside Saigon, there are quite a few uh, small, nice distillation units. Um, some of them are in terrible condition. Dubai, very much centered on two or three very big companies, um, Arabian, uh, Swiss Arabian and Ajmal, very modernized, very high tech facilities. Wonderful, uh, and, and around, but all mainly for export. And then in Riyadh, Riyadh, there are a surprising number of people involved in the distillation. As regards the Western world, I don't know outside of Gras anywhere doing it. I'm not sure. I'm sure maybe APRC has tried it. I'm not sure, but very, very few American, the IFF, Jibodan, there's very little work going on in this field outside. Uh, the only place I've ever seen it in the Western world is in Glass. Okay, next slide. Chemistry. Well, um, basically the chemistry is very complicated. Um, I don't, I'm not a chemist and I can't even, even read some of the words that are on that slide. It's, it's, it's very rich in sesquiterpenes and sesquiterpenoids. And this is probably the biggest signal of quality. Um, you will find that the best arbor wood could have, should have more than 70% of it should be in the form of sesquiterpenoids or sesquiterpenes. Now, these other key ingredients um, are also important. They are finding, I read a paper only a few months ago, uh, which was uh, a paper in Japan, uh, which uh, said that they've now discovered 120 new compounds over and above what I've listed here, um, we're still, we still don't know uh, much about it, I think. And we certainly, we need to do a lot more work on it. And I think this is, until we do, the synthetics that are produced, and there are many out there, will never really be able to mimic the true argawood aroma until they fully work out the chemistry of argawood. Uh, a lot of work now coming through, uh, particularly from China and from Japan. But just to uh, go back, when I started this, almost all the literature was in, not in English. I could find virtually nothing in English. Almost everything was in Japanese or Chinese. It was really difficult to find English language material. So, Kinam Agarwood. What is Kinam? Now, most people in the West, even today, don't know what this is. That is why the TRP project we started was in Vietnam. That is why Vietnam holds a central place in the Japanese world in, in Agawood. Kinam is, a, is widely considered the king of kings, the best Agawood in the world. 75% plus sesquiterpenoids, much of the, the product with a specific gravity of more than one, and hence sinking in water, and that the sunken wood is very interesting. That traditional knowledge said, if I can't, if the, the wood's chips don't float in water, I don't want to buy them. If they sink, then I'm going to take them. Simple quality control, very nice. Not necessarily always correct, but certainly you're, you're, you're going to get some good, good, good indications there. The other thing is about Kenan wood is it's very straight. You cut a piece of Kenan, all, all, the, all the lines where the, the resin is placed are in straight lines rather than scattered almost like a tiger skin blotchiness. So uh, Hinam Agarwood is of special importance and is why TRP focused its attention and had a, a special um, project area in the central highlands of Vietnam, Quantum province, which is where much of it is or was. And it's been devastated because uh, it's, it's known to be the most valuable. 
Quickly, uh, I think we've mentioned on this that incense is the main form of use traditionally, fragrance use, um, and not just fragrance, but fragrancing of clothes, keeping out mosquitoes, keeping out um, insects, rather like frankincense, it's done. You put it in your clothes, in your clothes drawers. And also in, in the Middle East, um, we have, um, for women, women love to make these incense, these balls of incense, which are made with argwood oil rich, or, along with roses and rose oil and mixes. And, and they will have um, these um, incense balls, if you like, fragrant balls. Ornamental use, if any of you have been to Kyoto in Japan, at least five of the major temples and will ha have huge uh, pieces of argo would hung in the central positions. These are, uh, some of them weigh nearly a ton. These are unheard of. It, they don't exist anymore. They're massive, great, huge, and these are worshipped. These are, but you will find all over the, 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 uh, the, the Asian world, people making argwood sculpture. Most of it is completely false. I've been into places where they are injecting engine oil, old engine oil, squeezing it up through the, through the wood and trying to make it pretend as if that's argwood resin. Um, quite extraordinary. And then you have the use in, in, in China and Japan, of course. In China, it's a very important medicine. And in Taiwan, there is a nationalized company making a thing called Chao Sheng Wine. This is a wine which is widely sold, which is using the distillation dust and crushed arbor, white arbor wood in a drink. And it's very popular indeed. Uh, and it's used as a carminative and uh, for people who have bad stomachs, which is how the Chinese uh, also in the TCM uh, Chen Yang is the Chinese name for arbor wood and is widely used for abdominal pain, vomiting and stomach problems. Next slide, please. Well, um, I, d I hope it wasn't because of people like us and TRP and other people. Somehow by about 1990, 2000, suddenly, the Western world caught on to its perfumers in glass and a few in elsewhere said, what a cool ingredient, let's put it into everything. And a, a whole a raft of about 30 perfumes came out with oud as a, a signature. Um, and I've listed some here, Cartier, Tom Ford, Frederick Marley, Robert Cavalli. Most people originally, if it was real, I would, would find this the aroma very strong and very lasting and overpowering. And as you know, most French perfume traditionally was much lighter with the move towards American perfumes, as we call them, which are much stronger and more long lasting. I think that that move towards the, the uh, use of Arbor Wood came. But with the cost, huge cost involved, it's really only the big Arabian companies. And when I say big, these are surprisingly large companies. I've listed them. Hajmal, Swiss Arabian, and Arabian Oud. Arabian Oud, for instance, as far as I know, has 200 outlets. Hajmal has at least 100 outlets around the world selling finished products of all types, all built around Argawood. And these companies are still using good quality distilled uh, natural products, whereas I can't tell you, I, I'm sure there are people listening in now who know whether the long, the arbor wood used in Longva is a natural or a synthetic, or maybe a mixture of both. But that's the situation. The fashion is, is going away maybe, but um, they are still mainly using synthetic. Next slide, please, because we have a lot to cover. I think I've covered most of this. Purity, adulteration, massive problem. Uh, as I say, I spent, I remember, three months looking to buy 250 grams of quarter of a kilo of 100% pure argo wood oil. And I could not find any. And eventually I had to buy it 
from one of the big companies who gave me certificates of analysis and could prove it. But it's almost impossible to find in the world. So purity doesn't exist. It's all adulterated in one form or other. So you're working from a zero, no standards, um, no DNA really yet to identify which is it, which type it is. So we're really struggling to get quality control and purity here in the real natural product. Next slide, please. Um, so we now move on to where we, where I started in this, having done nearly, uh, I think I worked for eight months walk, going around looking at how that market existed. The TRP project started. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is, uh, oh, sorry, before that, you need to know that CITES has been heavily involved with Argowood since 1996. It's uh, a good example. If you don't know what CITES is, it's called the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. It's an international organization protecting wildlife species against over-harvesting and over-use. So they looked at Argo Wood, they knew it was a problem, but they really didn't know what they were doing, neither did any of us. So they started saying, okay, well, the one we've heard about because we live in Singapore is Aquilera malassensis. We'll do an Appendix 2 listing of that. But then they realized that it actually wasn't the only one, and it was Krasner, and they were all here. And they gradually added more and more species and then gradually they thought well why don't we do the whole genera and then when they found Girinopsis. So for CITES Argawood has been I wouldn't say a nightmare but it's been a real challenge to them because it, it, it suffers from all the things that make it very very difficult to monitor and I really appreciate what they've been doing. They do an important job but they're doing it in very difficult circumstances because they don't really have not had the right tools. And hence, they've had to take a bit of a scattergun approach. Um, and also now with the advent of inoculation, whether we can certify what is sustainable and what is not is still a very big issue. Next slide, please. So the TRP Rainforest product, Project is not the only project in the world in which went about trying to sustainably grow Aquilera, and I think that's important. But it's certainly one of the most transparent and one of the most important. And the lesson I want to give you all is, and I want to make acknowledgement to Henry Hooverling, to Bob, about 10 of us decided with two people who opened their pockets and gave us hundreds of thousands of dollars they wanted to save this species and they would do anything to do it. And, and, and the magic of this project was that we took about 10 years of work, but we did it with $2 million and 10 people's minds. We managed to save a species. And I think this is a, I mean, I don't want to thank myself because I was a very small part of this project, but it is a remarkable thing and it should give courage to other people who want to save it. You can do it. Don't ever think you can't. You don't have to have huge international organizations to do it. If you really have the confidence and the desire, you really want to do something. and You get the best people. Next slide. So what did we do? Well, the first thing we do is to try and grow the tree because we had to grow it. No problem. We didn't find it any difficulty at all. It grows very easily. This is a, one of our nurseries in, in, in southern Vietnam. This is of Kinam. It grows very easily. You can grow hundreds of thousands of these trees. It's fast growing. It's softwood. But what have we got? We've got nothing but a tree which is softwood, has no value. Um, so, because we, we want this arbor wood, we want the resin. So, we need to create an inoculation process. So, who did we go to to? to make an inoculation process. We went to a Minnesota University, which was plant pathology department, which spent its life and still does curing diseases in trees. And we went to them and said, we want you to do the exact reverse of what you've always been doing. We don't want you to cure diseases. We want you to create a disease in a tree. And I think it blew them away when we actually asked them. 
to do this because we were a tiny little organization in this huge university. Why would they want to help us? But they did. They found the challenge so interesting that at least two or three of them spent years of their lives coming up with this inoculation process. And you can see a picture of it there. You see the, 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 the kit, which you see the, the, you can see the dark stains in the young arborwood. Um, so the kit was created and the kit was patented. And again, the uniqueness of this patent was through, we decided that the, the community, the forest cooperative in which we had been operating should be partnered in this process. So any royalties from this patented kit would go back to them. So we are, as far as I know, the first NGO in the world that has tried to do that form of benefit sharing through, through using a, a royalty and through a patent. Um, so this patented kit is available. A company was created called Cultivated Arborwood. And to this day, you can buy kits and you can buy the royalties, the rights to use those kits in different countries. Next slide, please. So what have we got? I told you, we are not the only company that did that. I would like to pay homage also to the Ajmal Company of Assam. These are Assamese Indians who went to Dubai. They spent also large sums of money and a lot of dedication. They have a patented um, in, uh, inoculation kit process for Indian arborwood. So between us and a few other companies, I believe in Australia now since then, we have managed to produce both how to grow the trees, how to inoculate them, and hence how to reduce pressure. And this, along with the growth in synthetics, has managed to take real pressure off what was a completely impossible situation as regards the wild harvested material. So I think the future of arborwood is good. It may mean that people will not pay $30,000 anymore for arborwood, but, and it will mean that there will be people who will, even now, who complain, who will say, no, no, your arborwood oil is no good. It's, 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 not, it's not as good as the wild harvested material, but it suffices for most use. And, and we have made good incense sticks, which are used in Japan, which are being made using cultivated inoculated arborwood material. So I think the story ends with a good, um, a good ending. Um, there's still a long way to go. There's still a lot of knowledge we don't know about arborwood. Uh, and there's still a lot to be learned. Uh, but I'm very keen to learn from you people. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you so much. I, I learned so much about this from you and it's just so fascinating, uh, the discovery of the inoculation to produce the agar wood. So thank you for teaching us that today. Uh, you actually have quite a few questions, so I'm gonna just start. Uh, there's questions about, can agar wood be replicated in places like West Africa or Brazil? Yeah, well, I, you I touched thought on that a little would, bit, but you have several people asking. I, I, I thought that would question would come up. Um, technically speaking, probably they could. We understand that the Australians are trying to do some work in Queensland because you know Papua New Guinea is not that far away from northern and up in Darwin. We'll first see how they get on there. I have heard mysterious stories that somebody in Brazil has managed to smuggle out some seeds, but um, so far it hasn't got, got anywhere. But uh, obviously if people are prepared to pay the royalty on the kits and the kit, the growing of the plant, I would doubt would be difficult in Africa or South America. The, the, the resin production, and the production of a good quality resin, I think, will be more challenging because it's, it's a difficult one to distill. It's a difficult one even. The inoculation process doesn't always work. So the answer is I don't know. Um, it could be rubber was brought from Africa, from Amazon to Malaysia. 
why not bring out? But obviously, people are concerned on intellectual property rights, Nagoya protocols, and all the rest. So you have to face all those things if you want to do. Yeah. Well, one of the folks asking that question was Wellington. And we know because he, he did a, a webinar just a few weeks ago uh, and he's brought many species there to Ghana and, and piloted growing them. So, of course, why, why wouldn't he want to know if, if agrowood could be replicated? Um, what is the name of the small district in Bangkok where there are concentrated agrowood vendors? I, I no. forgot. Sorry, I can't forgot. tell you. Um, so you. I'm happy to tell you. I'm happy to find it. It's in my notes, but it's quite a long okay. time ago. And I'm not, I'm not hiding from you, I promise. No, no. So, so Daniel asked a, a, a couple different questions regarding that around the essential oils and the oils and the vendors. And so, Daniel, uh, Denzel is inviting you to absolutely follow up via email. And for anyone on the webinar today, uh, you're always encouraged. We're happy to follow up with questions that don't sufficiently get answered or we don't have time to touch on. So please, uh, you know, uh, Denzel, if you want to put your uh, email yeah, in the I chat my, there. My, my website is there, Denzel.com. It's very easy. Right. Denzel.com. That's easy yeah. to remember. <laughs> so, Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, I hope you will follow up together with Denzel to, to get that question answered. Um, uh, Dr. Satyal is asking about, uh, you know, how much with East India or China producing more uh, and, and production from India, you had indicated is quite low or is non-existent uh, now. Yeah, correct? wild harvested material. Wild harvested material. As I did mention to him that there is a plantation and now a big plantation and outgrows as well organized by the Ajmal group and there's probably a good hundred hectares or more now of cultivated material available and there are the odd tree don't get me wrong the odd tree is found and the odd tree I told you people keep it a secret I don't tell you so and Assam as you know is a dangerous part of the world not everybody's you know people don't sort of wander around there so there is some more but very small quantities a few tons of pure wild harvested material but it more of the, the uh, more, more of the sustainably harvested is coming out mm. and i don't the think i is the only company there produce agarwood after they're inoculated or is it again still even with intervention and in inoculation mm. still low no i think that would be too expensive to do that our trees our inoculation 95 percent. i think the original idea you would have your money back or We'd give you a free kit. I can't remember if it's still done. But when we started, the you can have a free kit if it doesn't produce. Um, yeah. It's 95% sure. No, no, otherwise the whole process falls apart. No, it's a very sure system. Yeah. Very sure. Whereas you said in the wild, it was very rare, maybe one in 5,000, one in 10,000 trees actually becoming infected with this fungus and having the right conditions for the agar wood to be produced is very rare and you can really make this 95% effective in cultivation. That's sure. really tremendous. And, and listening to you talk about it makes me reflect that frankincense can be done sustainably because you don't have to kill the tree to get the resin, right? And a lot of these other uh, threatened or endangered species in aromatics, the plant actually has to be killed. Uh, to get the root or to get the wood, and uh, it gives me a lot of hope for frankincense because well, we do the tree is. Unfortunately, the EU project that I was on, where we did all the experiment, came to an end, and it's now just a commercial selling of kits. But we never really got to the stage of seeing whether we could actually save a tree. It's probably not economic to, to try and cut a bit out of a tree because we're growing it like. An agro like like Christmas trees, basically. You're just growing it, and the key issue only is how long do you grow it for. And people are greedy. I just was reading about somebody saying that they they've got stocks of um, sustainably harvested agro they can't sell. My gut feeling is that those people are people who tried to sell a tree after five years, and it's got a little resin, 
and it's not very good because it won't be very good because it needs about eight years uh, before yeah. you really get much oil out of it. So um, that's that sort of problem exists. But, um, basically, yeah. it's a lot cheaper to grow it, cut it down, and grow a new one. But, you know. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of chatter among some of our uh, our chemists on the chat. Uh, hi, Nicholas. It's great to see you here. Um, and he says, my samples are maybe wrong, but I noticed that the odor of burned wood is totally different from the odor of the oil. Do you agree with that, Denzel, that the odor of burning the wood is different than the odor of the oil? Um. It is different, but why? The question is, why is it different? Uh, Argo wood chips. If I took you, uh, Nicholas, to a, a market in Dubai and I burnt 20 different chips, totally different aromas to nearly all of them, with people who really know what they're doing. The, the, the Gironopsis, the smell of the Gironopsis from Papua New Guinea as wood is completely different. So you know what I mean? It's, are we talking like for like? So you've got an oil. Tell me about that oil. Which which wood was it from? Which species? Were, where did it come from? So if you could tell me that and then match it with the wood chips from that particular species, that's the question. Do I make any sense? No. <laughs> In other words... That made sense. A lot of this oil that you have seen is made from a jumble mixture of different species and different subspecies of argo wood. And if you do that, that oil will not, not smell the same as a piece of wood which has a known origin or a known species or subspecies. The Kinam okay. smell is completely different. And if you made oil from that, it would be very different from the oil, that very heavy oil from Cambodia, which is what most people know about, very sort of smoky, heavy, resinous oil. And the other thing is, Nicholas, the quality of distillation is appalling in most of these places, really poor quality. So if you go into a marketplace, I don't know what oil you're talking about, whether you distilled it yourself, obviously that's different, but if you bought oil from a, a stall in Singapore, or it's it's made in a really crude place, often not using stainless steel equipment. There's a lot of smokiness around. It's very polluted. It's not good. So, so my, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering my question properly. But are we sure, Nicholas? You're comparing like with like. That's the question. Hmm. Well, great. And again. Uh, you guys can follow up. We have also Nicholas Scott, who's asking, what is the size of the total annual market? And I'm assuming that's a difficult question since some of the trade is illegal. Some of it is legal and some of it is not even the right species. So what do you yeah, say about that, Denzel? <laughs> trade in what? Trade in what are we talking about? Oil or trade in... A word chips, trade in oil, trade in all wood. Well, well, uh, let's uh, let's break it down then. Let let's just say oil. I'm, what do you what do you think the size of the total annual market, or or actually the chips first, right? Because you can't get oil without chips. So the trade of the annual market of trade in chips. Well, we saw it's. We thought it was about four thousand tons, if I remember. Uh, was the total for chips, and yeah. most of the oil is coming from the four to five thousand tons of chips. Um, again, uh, and that's about right with Malaysia. I think if you look back in the chart, Malaysia giving about two and a half thousand tons. I haven't got, the, I can't see the figures in front of me. Uh, two and I think, and it said uh, Indonesia, uh, one and a half thousand tons. Isn't that right? Isn't that because we put a chart in, in this. Uh, yeah, two and a half, that's three, four, four, and then about a thousand elsewhere. That's the sort of figures we're talking about. So, um, four, yeah, four and a half, five and a half thousand. The the the, the natural, I mean, the the cultivated, harvested market has not been measured yet, and I would not think it's more than a because uh, these trees are the oldest of those trees are only ten years old. 
there aren't many places beyond that, except probably Ajmal's plantation in Assam that are older than 10 years. So there's not a lot that have been chopped down and sold as chips. And I think most of it's going to distillation anyway. So that I do not know the answer to the sustainably yep. harvested volume. Right on the heels of that, Wellington is asking how many kg of resin would be produced with this 95% well, not effectiveness. Per, year, per tree. Well, um, per tree, yeah. So how many kg of resin per acre, or th the way Wellington put it was how many kg of resin per acre with this 95% effective inoculation rate? And and maybe there's another way to ask that or get at that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's what is, you know, how much resin does a tree yield when you inoculate it's about it? Three, how, how how many inoculations are you giving it? You can give it more than one. Uh, you can keep it for more than, uh, it, it won't yield at all for the first five years, so six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We were looking, I mean, I, I haven't got it with me, the spreadsheet. I did look at it a couple of weeks ago that we did. It was between three and five kilos per tree was what we were looking at. Um, okay. But these were these were eight ten year old trees. Uh, that's the ideal. But I would say the bottom, the bottom level of that about three kilos of oil. But you're not going to get thirty thousand dollars for it. I'm afraid. You know, we weren't averaging that. We were looking at a thousand. If we could get a thousand, two thousand dollars for it, we'd be happy. So that was the sort of economic. <laughs> still not bad. No, no. Yeah. Still not bad. But you've yeah. got to pay for the inoculation which is in itself $20, $30, and the royalty. So you have to invest a bit in the sure. whole process. Well. Um, sure. But it does make money, yes. It, 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 it is profitable. I can, I can do that. Um, and part of that, Wellington, is, is a little bit of a trade. I'm, I'm hedging a bit because it is a bit of a trade secret. And I, I've got a confidence. I can't give you fully all the figures that I have in my hand, so to speak. Um, in that field. You're a man of not... mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it doesn't belong um, to me. Well, belong to cultivated art with those figures. Anyway, which is so. great. Which is great. Which is part of your your ethics of developing these programs. Uh, just just to clarify, for Nicholas Baldovini says he's currently trying to compare wood and the oil made from the wood. So it sounds like the two of you should follow up and talk and the last question before we close out this webinar and thank you everyone for such a robust q a period uh mm -hmm. lucia would like to know where she can get some seedlings for testing <laughs> she's not the only one um where is she based i i what believe country? she I'm... is in brazil i want to say brazil yeah. maybe she can she can well, Again, we, she wants to get them legally or, or illegally. I mean, legally. Legally, legally. <laughs> That's an offline I'm, discussion otherwise. <laughs> no, I won't. Legally. I don't go there. That's not with me. Okay. So um, assuming she can get all the permits, uh, we could put her in touch with uh, people who might be prepared to sell them seedlings and people who are growing, who've got plantations, who've got seedlings. Whether they're prepared to, that will be that will be up to them. I mean, and and I, I think they would want to know very much what you wanted them for, and how you were going to use them, and uh, if it was for research purposes, I'm sure it would be fine. If it was to uh, compete, it would not be fine. That. But happy again to have a dialogue with you about it. Wonderful. Well, thank you to you for sharing so much information with us today about the w world of Oud and Agarwood. And thank you to the audience and have a great rest of your day or evening. Yeah. Bye. And uh, thank you everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye.